And joining us now on the line from the nation's capital, Denis Grancourt, the professor from the University of Ottawa. Professor, how are you tonight? I'm great. I'm glad to be here, Steve. Good to have you on the program. Let's just, for those of our viewers who aren't familiar with your story, go through a bit of your background now, if we can. You're a tenured professor at the University of Ottawa. Yes, I'm a full professor and with tenure. And you've taught physics for how long there? 22 years. 22 years. Okay, last August you were told that you would be not given any further teaching assignments. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't taught since last winter uh, when I gave these uh, physics, advanced uh, physics courses. In December then, as the story moves along, you were recommended for dismissal by the university and suspended with pay as well. Is that right? That's right. I was suspended and, in fact, barred from campus. And the explanation you were given was what? Uh, there was no explanation, really, for the suspension and barring from campus. Uh, in my opinion, that was just superfluous. Uh, the the um, reason given for the recommendation that I be dismissed was that I had given A pluses, that I had attributed A pluses in one course arbitrarily. This is the nub of the concern, right? That you basically started the year by saying to all of your students, I'm giving you all A pluses, now let's proceed from there, right? It wasn't that simple what I said to the students. I actually explained my pedagogical method at the time, but that is the pretext that the university is using to dismiss me. That's right. Okay, and you have not been back to the campus since then? Oh yes, I have been. Uh, I, I was back after this suspension. I was back once to host my uh, Cinema Politica series that I've been running for years, and at that time, during the event, I was arrested, handcuffed, and taken off campus by Ottawa police. What did you think of that? I thought that was uh, over the top. Uh, wh and I they haven't done it since. There was a lot of media attention in relation to that arrest, and the university has been uh, applying a hands-off policy ever since. They have not, uh, you know, I, I even delivered a document in person to the president at one point. There was no mention that I shouldn't be here or anything like that. So c calmer heads have prevailed since then, you think? Yes, yes, thanks to the media attention, I believe. Well, let's get into this a little bit here. here this is off rabble.ca. This is you. I'm going to quote first here. With grades, students learn to guess the professor's mind and to obey. It is a very sophisticated machinery whereby the natural desire to learn, the intrinsic motivation to want to learn something because you're interested in the thing itself is destroyed. Grades are the carrot and stick that shape obedient employees and that prepare students for the higher level indoctrinations of graduate and professional schools. The only way you write to develop independent thinking in the classroom is to give freedom, to break the power relationship by removing the instrument of power. Okay, that's your explanation for yes, why... Yes, I want to confirm that I did say those things. You did indeed say those things. Okay. Mm -hmm. If not grades, how do you want to... What's the word I'm looking for? How do you want to evaluate your students if not by grades? I don't want to evaluate my students. I don't want to rank order the students for employers. That's not the goal. The goal is to optimize the education in the classroom, to optimize the learning. That, that's, my, that's my mission, that's what it says in, in my work description, that's what I'm about. So if, if employers want rank-ordered people, they can rank-order them themselves, they can interview them, they can give them standardized tests, they can do whatever they like, that's not my job. Nowhere does it say in my work description that I'm to do those kinds of things. Well, what do you it see says, as your job? Well, my job is to create an environment where true learning can occur that will lead to independent thinkers, responsible citizens and professionals who can make decisions, who, don't, who, who can evaluate and judge and discriminate the orders they're receiving in order to decide if they're ethical, if they're moral, if it's right, in order to criticize if they need to within the limits that they can and so on. That's my job. Do and you, we, I'm sorry, do you have any evidence that in fact grading systems negate independent thinking or a genuine yes. desire by students to learn? Oh yeah, there's the, the, you see this is not controversial when you look at the uh, teaching research field. When you look at pedagogy, this is not a controversial point. Grades are counterproductive. All the researchers uh, are, are clear on that point. The traditional teaching methods where you use grades in this way uh, do not uh, produce uh, a learning of the concepts, especially in the, in the physics and in the sciences. Um, there, there's an entire area of research called, for example, physics education research per, and the researchers are unanimous on this point. In fact, this is, this is their raison d'etre, is to try and fix that problem. It's recognized as a significant problem in our society and in the learning of complex uh, technological concepts. Don't your so there's, students themselves... there's no themselves controversy on that point. Well, don't, don't your students themselves want to know how they're kind of doing versus their fellow students or versus well, the rest I of the world? Well, I don't know... Well, they're, they're, they're trained to compete and to 
compare each other. So there, there's, a, there's a societal training there. But in terms of knowing how they're doing, of course, I talk with them. I give them feedback. In fact, I give them detailed feedback. I have more time to give them feedback because I'm not doing mindless grading. Uh, so uh, on that side, in terms of uh, the feedback and, and suggestions and, and recommendations and so on, there's plenty of that in this method. Okay, but don't students need to know whether they've in fact done what they need to do in order to, if I can use this word, to pass your course as opposed to fail your course? Do you not at least have to let them know, yes, you've passed, well, no, you've failed? The important thing that student, students need to know is whether or not they've understood something. They need to be able to discriminate for themselves as thinking individuals, have I understood this concept? And the way the educational system is um, constructed at the moment, it, 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 we bring students to the point where they can't even recognize that for themselves. They lose the power to discriminate. So even in fourth year physics courses, students are not able to actually know when they understand something, actually decide for themselves internally as a true learning process. So instead, they'll say things like, well, I need to know whether I understood this, so I need you to grade me to tell you what my grade is, and then I will know if I understood it or not. I mean, that's, that's the extreme to which we've arrived uh, in, in our system at the moment, which, which I think is a very sad thing. Okay, but what if one of your students has not completed what you feel to be, uh, to have a grasp of the basic understanding of what you're trying to inculcate in your class, what well, then? Yeah. In this method, I, I can spot that very early on because it's very interactive. I'm, I'm, I'm discussing with them all the time. I'm seeing their work. I'm asking them to tell me what they're doing, to report on their progress. So I spot that generally very, very early on, and I, I intervene. I'm, I'm very much an in-your-face professor. So uh, um, in fact, I've taken the grades away as an instrument of power, which means that the students ha feel free to interact with me, to tell me when they disagree with something, to tell me when they don't like something, to criticize me even. I tell them, if you want, I can even leave the room while you decide on a particular aspect of the course that you don't like, and so on. So I, I remove that, that, that top-down thing, and I replace it with a horizontal, very democratic structure where we talk about the concepts and about the subject and about their own personal development and how they're becoming professionals and what they're learning in the course. Okay, and they, admittedly, they compare though, notes on strategies, you know, how, how, how one, one student learns something in a good way, they share that with others, and so on. So that, that's what it's about in, in my classroom. I understand what you're saying, but um, now admittedly, my own experience here is a few, a few decades old, but I do recall when going to university that the professors in whose courses there were no exams um, found that as the year went on, the students stopped going to class because they knew they had to focus on the classes where actually there were exams and marks mattered. And I wonder whether or not um, it's the case in your class that well, if there are no marks, people will stop caring. Yeah, I haven't observed that. At the beginning of uh, the year, some students said, if you don't force me to, I won't be motivated. I won't do it. That was the immediate sort of guttural response to this very novel technique that I was proposing at the beginning of the year. But those same students who had said those things came to understand what it was about, came to find their own uh, intrinsic motivation for the subject itself, and came to participate in a true way like they had, they, they, they'd never had an experience like that in their entire degree up till now, which is why they had this notion that I, they needed to be forced to learn things. Uh, so I have not observed the problem that you're referring to, but then again, I'm very hands-on and I don't just let things go, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much um, interacting and trying to find out where the students are at. And, and remember, th I did this in small classes. These were small classes where you could actually apply uh, this technique. The largest class where I applied it uh, was a, a, a first year um, course where there were 45 students. And I found that it was still manageable in a, in a context like that. OK, it, it so, just, quite so well. just so I'm, I'm clear on this then, if you were a, a first year poli-sci professor and you had 900 kids in your class, 900, excuse me, students in your class, could you, do, could you teach the way you're teaching? I would have to adapt it, that's for sure. And I did do a large class like that at one point, not quite 900, but a very large class uh, using the satisfactory, non-satisfactory grading system. And I found that that worked very, very well. OK, well, that's a grade. Yeah, that's a grade, sure. So you're not opposed to giving grades? Oh, I, I assigned A pluses. I gave grades. No, no, but, but, but the A pluses you assigned were on the basis of not having seen any of the talents or abilities of any of your students. You're saying oh, no, that that's not true. That's not true. That's a misconception. Well, I thought you said uh, you, everybody gets an A plus, and you said that at the beginning of the year. 
Well, you said that I said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, well, let's, okay. Part, part of this exercise is to clarify uh, truth from fiction here. Did you yes. say to the students at the beginning of the year, you're all getting A pluses, so don't worry about that. What, what, this about, what this class is about is not so much the grade, it's about having a grasp of the material. Have I got that I, right? I said that, but I said many other things in addition, because I need to put that in, in its proper context. So I, what I did at the beginning of the year is I explained the pedagogical method, how it was intended to function, how I would interact with them, how they would report their progress. I explained all of these things, and I also uh, cited the pedagogical research that shows that uh, students don't learn in the traditional way, and in particular physics. And one thing that's very interesting that I did early on in the semester that was a real shock to many of the students is I took an example from first-year physics. You have to remember these are graduate and fourth-year physics students. I took an example of a, of a concept that we're told that we've all understood when we did first year uh, as physicists, which is Newton's action-reaction law. And I asked a very simple question about that concept, and I drew a picture on the board, and I asked the students what the answer was. And it turned out that in a class of 24, um, one student said what the answer was, two students didn't want to answer, and all the others had the incorrect answer, an incorrect answer. And then I went on, I made sure they understood what I was asking, I made sure there were no misunderstandings, and I went on to explain why that answer was wrong, the predominant answer, and how it was that that answer, the fact that they answered that way, showed that they had not understood the fundamental concept. Well, it was a jaw dropper for these students. They were <laughs> in shock uh, because they were under the impression that they had understood this, this one of uh, Newton's basic laws. And then one of the students said, but you tricked us. You asked it in a, in a strange way. And then uh, several students came to my defense and said, no, he didn't. He asked it very clearly in three different ways. It was very clear what he meant. We answered the wrong answer. We, we had not understood that concept. And then for the first time in their, in their physics careers, I explained Newton's action-reaction law again. And for the first time, I think, they really listened to try to grasp it because they'd just been uh, confronted with the idea that they hadn't understood it before. So these kinds of exercises allowed me to demonstrate to the students that it was worth trying this novel method because it was going to lead to understanding. And if you have understanding, uh, you have uh, the power to discriminate, and you also have the power to extend your knowledge and to be creative with it, which is what I think we want in our advanced scientists and engineers and so on. Have you always taught this way? No. Uh, I discovered these techniques uh, late in my career. I've started uh, applying this and, and really going into the classroom with these kinds of approaches in around 2004, 2005. Do you think you could have been hired had you told your administrators up front, this is the way I want to teach? Um, uh, there are many examples of that experiment that you just described. There are many colleagues across North America who have been trained in these techniques under the physics uh, education research sort of umbrella and who uh, are hired specifically because they're going to be applying those techniques. So I guess it just depends on the local culture of the university or the department that you're entering, whether or not they're familiar with these techniques and, and whether or not they're willing to, to look at them. Uh, speaking of familiar, I suspect you're familiar with what Stanley Fish has been writing on his blog in the New York Times. Certainly. Let me read an excerpt here just so uh, sure. our viewers can know and then you can comment on it. Here nakedly, Stanley Fish writes, is the reasoning I attributed to Rancourt. The university may pay my salary, provide me with a platform, benefits, students, an office, secretarial health, and societal status, but I retain my right to act in disregard of its interests. Indeed, I am obliged by academic freedom to do so. It would be hard to imagine another field of endeavor in which employees believe that being attentive to their employer's goals and wishes is tantamount to a moral crime, but this is what many, not all, academics believe. Uh, okay, well, what's I mean, wrong that, with that, what he says? It's a total fabrication. I mean, it doesn't represent anything I've ever thought, anything I've ever said. He's not citing anything. It's not based on anything I've written or said. Uh, so I, I don't know where it comes from. Well, I think what I he's mean, suggesting, let me, let me speculate here. I think what he's saying is you got hired under one set of pretenses and then you have unilaterally decided midway through your professorial career to apply new standards, new methods of teaching with which, with which your administration does not agree and you mm. somehow feel you ought to be allowed to do that. No, I, I don't think he would say something like that because no, no administrator or professor would ever say something like that. The whole idea of the university is to be developing uh, better techniques, to be experimenting with pedagogy, to be experimenting with, with knowledge, to be researching. That's the whole idea of this institution. So nowhere in the contract that I signed 22 years ago did it say 
um, I will use this particular pedagogical method, I will grade in the standard way. Nowhere in my contract did it say anything no, like that. I, I'm sure that's true, but it also didn't say you could not give marks altogether. Uh, it said that I could develop and apply the most that I should, that I had a responsibility to, be, to keep up to date with pedagogical methods, and that I should do the best I can for my students, which I believe is what I'm doing, that's what I've always said. So this fabrication from Mr. Fish is, is just that, a fabrication. Well, okay, but at, at the end of the day, I, I presume one of two things has to happen. Either you've got to do it their way, or if you can't get them to see it your way, you've got to leave, right? You have to resign. Uh, so no, which is it? that's not how it works. Uh, the way it works is if there's a dispute on a question like this, it eventually goes to, an, to the legal system, to an arbitrator, who is a professional who will look at the arguments on both sides, who understands what academic freedom is, uh, professional independence, what a professor's responsibilities are, and who will look at both sides and, and come up with a decision. And I firmly believe that uh, the, the university has a very weak position here, that I have a very strong one, and I think the university even knows that. I, can, I, 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 I surmise that it knows that from the way that it's behaving, but I don't think that, that's, that the university cares that it has a weak position. I believe that this is a political firing, that the grades thing is a pretext, that it's all about getting rid of a dissident professor, a professor who criticizes the institution, who has uh, very openly been a whistleblower and a, and a critique. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen my blog, uofowatch.blogspot.com, in which I report what I consider to be uh, malfeasance of, of many members of the upper administration, and I put the proofs and the documents. I've had uh, legal threats in relation to that blog and so on. So I really think that the grades issue in terms of my job is a pretext and it will not stand up in court. However, it will hurt. Uh, it will mean that I will not have a salary while, while the legal dispute is ongoing. These legal disputes uh, we've seen from political firings in the past in Canada. For example, Nancy Oliveri at U of T, it took 12 years before her situation was normalized. Uh, and so th this can take a long time and that's what it's about. It's about uh, taking out um, someone who is not uh, obedient uh, in the sense of orthodoxy within the institution. Is there any other professor at your institution that you know of who teaches with this same philosophy that you do? Yes, there are several. Uh, and there, there are several professors that g give uh, high grades of this type and for the same reasons. And these professors, um, I've, I've spoken to several of them, uh, they're afraid to speak out publicly here at the University of Ottawa and with good reason as you can see. Uh, but I think that if the university were to do statistics on grades, they would find several examples in several programs, and notably in the Faculty of Education, where these things are uh, understood by many people, where you have examples where advanced courses such as the ones I gave, basically everyone gets an A+. And for those colleagues of yours who don't agree with the approach you've taken, what's your relationship like with them these days? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I don't really have a relationship with most of my colleagues because uh, they, they generally don't want to see me or speak with me and I'm officially barred from campus and so on and so this makes them very ill at ease. So the, the, the people that don't agree with me will typically write comments on my blog or will write uh, letters of complaint to my dean and things like that but I, I, I never have a chance to discourse with them. I would love to debate any one of them on a, a television show such, a, such as yours or anything like that, but they simply will not stand up to the plate and debate these questions. Well, let's have a virtual debate here for a second. We did have Stanley Fish on our program uh, not too long ago, and um, let's play a little clip of what he had to say, and then we'll give you a chance to come back after that, okay? Roll tape, okay. please, Michael. Discussing any issue in the classroom is fine, so long as the issue is discussed in academic terms, that is, made the object of a certain kind of interrogation uh, where you look at the forms of arguments, histories, affiliations of various positions. But the moment when you try to nudge your students into taking a position in one direction or the other, you've crossed a line. You're no longer get engaging in pedagogy. You're engaging in some form of preaching and probably of indoctrination. A simple question. Okay, do so you that, do that? Yes. Yeah, so, so that's a, a general comment. It's not specifically directed at me, but I'd love to respond to that comment. I think that's um, if that approach is, is a lot of crap and it's harmful. Uh, basically, I think we need to show our students that it's good to have opinions and it's good to try to express the, the, those opinions as clearly as we can 
to, to bring forth our best arguments so that students can consider them and then rebuttal and find their best arguments and answer. And the context in which you can do that is one where you don't have a power relationship with the student. So if you remove the instrument of power, the student will uh, feel the freedom to um, object to what you're saying and to bring forth their arguments in an honest way. That's the idea of removing this, this instrument of power, which is grades. So I, quite to the contrary, I, I disagree with Fish and I agree with Socrates. Uh, and Socrates was one who would bring forth his best arguments or help the other person to see the problems in their own arguments. And I tend to use those methods um, and um, I find them very, very beneficial in the classroom. I find that they, it helps to develop very sharp minds who are able to defend their position, who are able to see the problems and the holes in another person's position, and so on. I think those are the techniques we need. None of this political correctness of, you know, you have to be academic, whatever that means, and therefore you never really give your position, but you're citing this and that in a bland way. I, I totally disagree with that point well, of view. Let, let's see if the comparison to Socrates works. I, because I, I feel that it's irresponsible to even argue that as an academic. Well, uh, th again, the, the comparison to Socrates, let's see if that works. Um, we're a long way from fifth century Greece today. We're also, um, you're teaching physics. Where you're going presume... to talk about hemlock, aren't well, you? Well, no, I'm not going there. Don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, as far as I know, and I didn't do that well in physics, but there's pretty much a right or a wrong answer to a lot of what you discuss in physics, whereas in philosophy there are no wrong answers ever. Okay, so, well, I, I need to correct can you, you make right that, off. Can you make That's that comparison? True. That's not true. There is, there is, it, it's not clear-cut right or wrong in physics. There is a lot of discussion to be had. There is a lot of subtlety. There is a lot of depth in the concepts that are being discussed and, and, and proposed. And there's, there's often, uh, there are often schools of thought and, and interpretations. For example, you've heard of the various uh, mainstream interpretations of quantum mechanics and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of room for this kind of deep exploration where the individual, as someone who's becoming a scientific researcher, needs to dig inside themselves and say, OK, what have I understood? Why is this not working? Why is this interpretation that's being proposed? Is it valid or not? And what arguments can I use? There's a lot of that happening in physics, especially as you get into the uh, advanced physics. Uh, so I have to disagree with you on that okay. point immediately. Well, I, I wasn't taking the position. I was just throwing it out there. But okay. let, let me ask one last thing here, and that is, you know, for, for the people who are watching this tonight and who, are, who may be during the course of our conversation saying, yeah, you know, he's got a point there and he's got a point there. But at the end of the day, to go to university and not get graded, they may say, is nuts. At the end of the day, you got to get a grade, you got to uh, pass you know, if you want to get a degree. That's the way Steve, it is. Steve. Speak to them. What, what is nuts is to go to university to get graded and to not learn anything. That's the nutty thing. But the why does it have to be one or the other? Stands, why is well, it one or the I, other? I'm just saying it doesn't have to be one or the other, but that's what's happening now. That is the reality as we speak. Okay? If you, if you do uh, an analysis of the situation, and, and researchers have done this. They take students coming out of their degrees and they test to what extent in physics, for example, which is the area that I know, they test to what example these students have learned the concepts. And they're appalled to find that they have not learned the concepts. And this is why they say there's a problem in physics education. So we're too focused uh, on grading and not enough on learning right now. Well, we're not focused on learning at all. It's not about not enough. You have to be some to, for it to be not enough. There is no focus on learning. It's all about rank ordering students for potential employers and as entrance criteria for graduate schools. And uh, it, it's all about obedience. It, it really is. I mean, I'm coming back to that quote you read at the beginning, but it really is about breaking down the student. You know, you have to hand this in at a, at a, at a particular time, whether you understand it or not. I want it to be produced in this way. And these, these, are, the, these are the things you have to satisfy. And let's go. And then there's, there's several per week, and you have several courses. This is what you must do whether you understand it, whether you've had time to reflect on it, read the material or not, you just do this. That's called training someone to be obedient. And you, you do that in the undergraduate degree. You break them down. They, 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 they stop being able to discriminate what they understand, what they don't understand. It's a very sad situation. It's a horrible thing to do to individuals. And then at the graduate level, you pick them up again, and you tell them they're great, and you, you bring them to the next step, which is to indoctrinate them, which is to get them by a very sophisticated method to adopt the ideology of their future employer and to be able to project it themselves. 
And that's what professional and graduate schools are about. If you do an institutional analysis, that's what you discover. That's what this is. is. That's what this is. This is what you see when you, when you analyze it from a distance like that. Um, that's the problem. Professor Rancourt, it's very good of you to join us on TVO tonight, a fascinating issue, and I hope you'll keep us posted on what happens with your issue. Thanks so much. Okay, it's been a pleasure.